Hey, have you ever had a broken relationship? I'm not talking about just a romantic relationship, but any sort of relationship. Maybe it's with an in-law or an extended family member. Maybe it was your neighbor or a co-worker. Have you ever had a broken relationship? A relationship that at one point you thought was so strong that nothing could come between you two, and then all of a sudden you're saying to yourself, how did we get here? How did we get here? I thought we were solid. I thought we were in a solid state. I thought relationship, like nothing was going to come between us. And you find yourself stuck because you don't know what to do. Maybe you haven't been in that situation before. Obviously, there's going to be some hurt involved and there's going to be anger. And I know from my experience, when I'm feeling stuck, hurt, or angry, I'm not making wise decisions. I'm not, I've got a cloud in my mind and I can't think clearly. A lot of the time, these broken relationships can come down to this. They saw things their way, and of course, you saw things the right way. You saw thing, they saw things their way, and you saw things the right way. You couldn't understand why your relationship wasn't making progress, why it wasn't becoming fixed, because you thought, if you'll just see things my way, we'll be on our way. It's simple, right? Just see things the way I do. Uh, don't worry about your worldview, but if you see the things the way I do, then we'll be on our way. If you think about your fractured, awkward, broken relationship, it could be recent or it could be in the past and you still haven't mended it. It could be at work or it could be with a family member, a friend. Isn't it true that if they would see it your way, then everything would be okay? If they could just read your mind or have the same worldview as you, then everything would be okay. So for the next few weeks, we're going to address a question that I'm sure you've asked, asked at one point in your life. I know I have. What's wrong with these people? Why can't they just see things my way? Don't they understand? Maybe it's like uh, you're, you work and you have employees under you, and don't they just know what I want from them? Don't they just, can't they just read my mind and know the expectations? So the title of this new series, How to Get People to See Things Your Way. Some of you don't know if I'm being serious or not, you'll find out. The subtitle of this is, so how to see things your way, back one, which is the right way. Because until they do, right, until they see things your way, then they're just in your way. They're, they're holding up the progress. They're, they're keeping your family in a, in a state of turmoil or ruining yet another Christmas dinner because it's just awkward. This could be maybe you have uh, in this series, if you have someone like in school, you're trying to convince them that biology is really important for their future. Maybe in this series will help you to get your ninth grader to understand and see things your way. Or, or maybe it's with your mother or your mother-in-law and and. They, whenever they come to your house, they're judging and evaluating everything they do. And so in this series, maybe you will be able to convince them that to see things your way and to cut that out. And, and so maybe you can have them over a little bit more. Or maybe it's a brother-in-law or a brother who three Christmases ago, you had a blow up in your relationship and it just hasn't been the same since. Maybe in this series, you'll, they'll see things your way and the relationship would be fixed because that's how it works, right? That's how it works. So, let's jump in. To get people to see things your way and to get them to apologize, you have to have a set of tools. You need to have some people management tools because people love to be managed, right? You love to be managed. You love people telling you what to do and how to do things. We love being managed. So we came up with this, the, the C4 approach to relationships. C4 is a common variety of plastic explosive, but that's completely coincidental, okay? This approach is going to bring people together. This is going to bring people together. In reality, they will be moving in your direction, so it's going to be perfect. They're going to start seeing the world the way you do. So they can see from your perspective. 
So there are four components to this approach. Tell me if you agree. You convince them, convict them, coerce them, and control them. That's a recipe for success. So for the next four weeks, we'll discuss each one. And if you harbor any doubts of the uh, effectiveness of the C4 approach to relationship management, just stick with me. But I'm going to give you a word of warning, okay? It's very important that you don't share this information with the person that you have a broken relationship with. Very important, right? Because as, as, as irrational as that might seem, they are convinced that you are the problem. They're convinced that you are the problem. And so if they get their hands on this tool, the C4 relationship management tool, if they get their hands on this tool, you are liable then to move into their direction. No longer will they be coming to your direction. You'll be moving to their direction. After all, you respond well to these things, right? You, you respond well to being convinced and convicted and coerced and controlled, right? That's right. We all do. <laughs> Don't these help people draw closer to you? Doesn't it help you draw those around you closer to you? No. They do not work at all. Actually, we naturally put up a wall, right? We, when these things start to happen to us, we put our defense, defense wall up and we go on the defense right away. So we know that these things don't work, right? It's very silly me saying those things. But what happens when we're trying to restore relationship are these are actually the first tools we often go to. We know they don't work, but we often go to these things the, the, at the very beginning. They're the first tools in the toolbox that you reach to, re, to repair your relationships. But you know that it don't work. But what happens is it makes things worse. When you use these tools, because maybe you just don't have the knowledge on how to restore relationships, when you try to convince, convict, coerce, or control someone, obviously you're going to make the situation so much worse. Nothing gets resolved. Nothing gets resolved. We tell ourselves, there's nothing else I can do. I've tried everything. I tried. I just don't care anymore. If they're not going to try to fix the relationship, I'm not going to try to fix the relationship. Or we, try to, we continue to try to fix things the wrong way, which drives them further away. It doesn't seem like it should be hard to fix broken relationships, but it is. It's very hard to fix or repair broken relationships. So I thought we should talk about it, which is why the actual title of this series is Reassembly Required, The Beginner's Guide to Repairing Broken Relationships. And in this series, we're going to talk about decisions that you can make to pave the way towards reconciliation with other people, right? Relationships, they're a little bit like cars. It's, it, we're better at starting them. We're better at driving them than we are repairing them. In fact, if you're anything like me and you try to repair your car, you're going to make it a lot worse if you don't take it to a professional. It's, uh, relationships are a lot of, uh, it's very similar to cars, because starting a relationship, it's intuitive. We know how to do that. Maintaining a relationship is a little bit less intuitive. We're not, sometimes we're not so sure. But fixing one, that's not intuitive at all. That's not something that comes naturally to us. That's something that's actually quite difficult. So our initial moves, because it's not an intuitive thing, it's not a natural thing, is we often make the wrong moves we reach for the wrong tools in the toolbox. While we know these tools don't work, we, you know these don't work, we're not always aware when we're actually using them. You're not conscious that you're actually being, you're, you're convicting them or you're being controlling or you're trying to convince them to see things the way that you see them. When you use it, you're not always aware that you're using them, but the receiver of the words are often very aware that you're using them. So here's an example. Um, if you're trying, maybe you've used this phrase before, and for you, you're not trying to control them at all, but to the receiver, they're getting a different message. I'm sorry if I offended you. The user thinks I'm moving in your direction, I'm being the bigger person, I'm apologizing, we're trying to fix this relationship. That's what the user thinks. But the, the receiver, it's communicating, 
you're too easily offended. What I said wouldn't have offended most people. Why is it offending you? This implies that you're less mature than most people. I've, I've done the same thing to others and they weren't offended. Why are you offended? You're a lot less mature than I thought you were. So if I offended you, I'm sorry. And by saying this, you're insulting them and you don't even know you insulted them. You're trying to fix the relationship. Your intentions are good, but you're actually driving a bigger wedge in the relationship. Here's another statement that's convicting and coercive, yet it doesn't feel like it to the person that's using it. I said I'm sorry. Why are you still upset? Right? This is actually, I was thinking about this, and with kids, sorry is like the magic word, right? Because we tell them when they, have it, when they do something to harm someone else or there's an accident that you say sorry, and it's like everything goes away if you say sorry, right? It's the magic words that heals all wounds. I said I'm sorry. Why are you still upset? So the receiver or the user is actually trying to fix the relationship, but the receiver is saying, I've done my part. You should be fine now. Since you're not fine, clearly something is wrong with you. I've done everything I can, so now you're the problem in the relationship. We should be back to where we were. What's wrong with you? Fixing and repairing a broken or damaged relationship, it's not intuitive. And we reach for all the wrong tools far too often. And we say the wrong things. But the good news is reassembling a broken relationship is a learned skill. And so maybe you're thinking and you don't really have any broken relationships. Well, still pay attention because there are tools that you'll learn in this series that you'll be able to apply to your life in future broken relationships. And it's not my hope that you have broken relationships, but people mess up. And so there probably will be some sort of fracture in some of your relationships. So make sure that you pay attention, even if you don't feel like you've got broken relationships right now. Most of us weren't actually taught how to fix relationships, or we weren't taught how to fix them well. Most of us haven't had it modeled to us either. You've probably seen this played out with your parents, right? Uh, maybe they've been estranged from your aunt or uncle. And from your vantage point, you're just like, dude, just call them and make it better. But they just don't know where to start because it's not a learned skill. You're just saying call them, but they don't know where to begin. And it leads to the holiday avoidance dance. You know the holiday avoidance dance? You say things like, when are they coming again? So you're sort of mapping out the whole holiday and trying to see how much you can avoid awkward situations. You say things like, how long are they staying, right? Oh, yes, I've got a golf weekend with my buddies. I can't actually make it to that holiday dinner. Or you play the wedding or graduation no eye contact game. Then later on, somebody gets sick, somebody gets injured, a mutual friend passes away, and suddenly, amid tragedy, what seemed to be a ginormous problem gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And then people push through the emotion and awkwardness to say and do what they should have done a long time ago. And instead, instead, they didn't. They didn't say what they should have said. They didn't do what they should have done a long time ago. They missed out on years of relationship, on years of regret, years of relationship. They've missed out and they spent all their time waiting waiting for the other person to come to them, waiting for the other person to make the first step, rehearsing, rehearsing the history of events so that when that person does come, you can write yourself as the hero or the good guy in the story. Or until that doesn't happen, though, you're avoiding. You end up waiting for the other person to do what you should do. You should do it because you're the better person. You know how I know you're the better person? Because when you do rehearse the story in your head, you put yourself into the story, back to the slide, as the, other per as the better person. It's their fault the relationship is broken. And so if you're the better person, you should be the bigger person and take the first step to mend the relationship. The better person should initiate reconciling relationships. And here's the thing. Here's the really hard thing with relationships. Um, for the most part, you both want the same thing, Right? You both want things to go back to the way they used to be, but sometimes we just don't know how. We haven't been taught how. Because it's hard. 
Relationships take work. Relationships are hard. And this is an emotional topic for some. And men, I know this can be terrifying. Because there's something in you that you're just not sure how you'll look. Or you're not sure how they'll respond. Or you're not sure with what emotions will come to the surface. And you just don't know how to deal with them. So you're going to suppress them. And you're just going to pretend like nothing has ever happened. You're going to sweep it under the rug. And there's going to be an elephant in the room whenever you see that other person. And maybe, maybe this is why your father or your grandfather has been so shut down. Because they're afraid to go there. They've swept it all under the rug. But they're not going to lift the rug to address the mess that's there. Sometimes we just don't know how to deal with it, and we, we are afraid. We're afraid of what other people are think, or we're afraid if we're going to be vulnerable and apologize or try to mend the relationship. Well, what if they don't actually want that? So I'm just going to back off and wait for them to come to me so I don't have to have failure. We've got fear of failure. So because this is such a tricky subject, or it, it, everyone's at different playing fields, you're on a different yard line or meter line on the field. I want to take off all expectations and pressure. Okay? I want to reduce the expectations and reduce the pressure. Because when it comes to reassembling adult relationships, the goal isn't reconciliation. I want to take the pressure. I want to lower the expectations a little bit. The goal isn't reconciliation. Why? Because unlike a broken dish or a broken toy or when you crack your cell phone screen, we don't have access to all the pieces. When you break a toy, you've got all the pieces and you can manipulate them and you can put them back together. But with a relationship, you've only got half the pieces. You can't, do, you can't get the pieces from the other person. They hold part of the pieces and you hold part of the pieces. So we work and we pray towards reconciliation, but that's not the goal. Why is it not the goal? Well, here's a relationship tip for you. Never set a goal for another adult. Doesn't go well. Only set goals for yourself. Because why? A goal is an agenda. And an agenda undermines relationships. It's like a third party, right? It's somebody that's always there. You've got, you've got this agenda. They can't maybe take you for face value. Never set a goal for another person because it's an agenda, and agendas undermine relationships. Agendas ensure broken relationships stay that way, that they stay broken. This may explain why your past attempts of uh, repairing or restoring relationships have failed. Because you had an agenda. You were trying to take the pieces from the other person. Here's a question. Do you enjoy people who have an agenda for you? I don't think so. Parents, this may be why your adult kids keep checking their watch when they're visiting you. Why? Because do you enjoy people who evaluate and judge you? No. No, we don't. So as we move through this series, the goal isn't reconciliation. What is the goal then? No regrets. The goal is no regrets. It's knowing that you did everything that you possibly could do. You opened the door, you put down the welcome mat, you put down the drawbridge, and you removed every unnecessary obstacle to reconcile with that person. Relationship is a two-way street, but you can know, the goal is that you can know that you did everything in your power, everything humanly possible to close the gap, to meet them halfway, and then, you know, let the pieces fall where they may fall. The goal isn't reconciliation. The goal is no regrets. And we're going to learn how to take the pressure off to allow the other person to move towards reconciliation. We always have a part to play when it comes to reconciliation process, when it comes to the process, right? No matter who's at fault, no matter who's done the wrong thing, no matter who's at blame, both sides of the party have a part to play when it comes to reconciliation, which leads me to this question. Why in the world are we talking about this at church? Well, I've run out of topics, obviously. No. Why are we talking about this at church? Well, we're talking about this in church because for Jesus followers, this isn't optional. And by the way, if you're watching, if you're in the room or you're watching online and you're not a Jesus follower, this is optional for you. 
I don't have the right to tell you how to live your life, but I do want to invite you to give it a go because if you do try these things that we're going to talk about over the next four weeks, maybe, just maybe, your relationships will begin to become restored. But that's optional for you if you're not a Jesus follower. But if you're in the room, if you're online, and you consider yourself a Jesus follower, this is not optional. Reconciliation is the operative noun of the Christian faith. This isn't optional. This is what we do as Jesus followers. Restoration of relationship. Restoration of relationship. The story of redemption is the story of how God reconciled members of the rebel race to himself. And the church confuses this this sometimes, right? He was not content to simply forgive you. He wasn't content to forgive you. He, he was not content to simply forgive you. He, forgiveness was half of the equation. Forgiveness was only half of the equation. I can, for, I can forgive you, but I can still not be reconciled to you. I can forgive you and still not be reconciled to you. Reconciliation is the win in our relationships with God and with other people. But some point in the line, and towards, uh, according to Jesus, reconciliation with God and with with people are connected because Jesus would say things like what you do to your brothers and your sister you're actually doing to your heavenly father so Jesus introduced this theme that it's just as important to be reconciled to your brother and your sister as it is to be reconciled with God but the church conveniently separated the two because reconciling with people is so inconvenient Forgiveness is much easier, right? Reconciliation is hard, it's messy. Forgiveness is easy. Why? Because you hold all the cards. You control the process. You control the outcome. Reconciliation is inconvenient. It's sometimes unsafe, sometimes unwise, but for the most part, I'll say it's always uncomfortable. Unfortunately, Christianity was reduced to forgiveness. God forgives me. I forgive you. Now I've got nothing else I need to do. God forgave me. I forgive you. Now I'm good. Nothing else for me to do. And that version of Christianity just keeps us looking up, right? Rather than looking around. We don't have to look around. Read the Gospels and you'll see that God was not content to simply forgive you. God's forgiveness was a means to an end. It was a means to an end. God forgave you. He, he I was talking about removing every unnecessary obstacle to bring reconciliation. God forgave you to remove the biggest obstacle between you and him. He forgave you to remove our sin. Because without, with, with the sin in the way of you and God, the reconciliation couldn't happen. Forgiveness was a means to an end. And the end and the win is reconciliation. It's reconciliation and a reassembled relationship with your heavenly Father. At the end of his earthly ministry, Jesus commanded us to do to others what he did for us. He said, love others as I have loved you. I was not content to just forgive you. I went the extra mile to reconcile a relationship with you. It's all about the relationship. It's not a, you can forgive at an arm's length, but you cannot reconcile relationships at an arm's length. You've got to be together. I want to close with one of the Apostles Paul instructions along this line. If you don't know who the Apostle Paul is, he was somebody that initially, he comes onto your pages of history as Saul, and he wanted to take down Christianity. He wanted to to destroy the church, and to be honest, he was doing a really good job. I mean, he was a lot more effective at destroying the church than the disciples were at building the church up. So God said, hey, let's recruit this guy Saul onto our team, and let's have him become the most influential influential church planter in the history of the world and that's who Paul became he planted churches all along the Mediterranean and he'd write letters to these churches to encourage them with where they were at and that makes up like half of your New Testament which is the second half of your Bible so this is what he's the Apostle Paul says in Philippians 2 5 he says in your relationships with one another what relationships all of them 
in all of your relationships, in your broken relationships, in your strong relationships, in the relationships that you actually wouldn't mind if they stayed broken, in all of your relationships, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. In all of your relationships, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Paul is saying, in all of your relationships, I want, to, I want you to approach them as your heavenly father demonstrated his approach to relationships through his son, Jesus Christ, how he approached relationships. So what was Jesus' mindset? What was his mindset? Do you remember the parable of the, the lost sheep where there was a shepherd, he had 100 sheep, and one walked away, one went astray, and the shepherd went after the lost sheep and he left the 99. Often we read that parable in context of like that lost sheep having to be reconciled to his heavenly father. But what lost sheep do you have in your relationships? What lost sheep do you, what broken relationships do you have that you need to go and do everything you can to remove obstacles to become reconciled to that person again? See, it's not just about between reconciliation between God and his people. It's, be, it's reconciliation between God and his people and his people's people. How did Jesus approach his relationships? Well, the religious leaders would often ask Jesus, hey, why are you going towards sinners to have reconciliation? Why are you going to, why don't you just, Jesus, do you know who you are? I mean, why don't you let the sinners come to you and let them get their, like, pull their butts into line and come and reconcile with you? And Jesus, how he would respond to this relig these religious leaders, he answered them. It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I haven't come to call the righteous, but to sinners to repentance. I'm not waiting for everyone to have it all together before they can come to me. I am going to go to them where they are at. Jesus, he could have forgiven at arm's length, but you cannot reconcile at arm's length. Reassembling requires moving in the direction of the unreconciled. If we choose to follow Jesus, if you're a Jesus follower, we'll do the same. We won't wait for the, uh, the broken relationship, the other person, to come to us. We will go to them. We will move and remove every obstacle possible. Again, the goal isn't reconciliation. The goal is no regrets, to know you did everything you can in your power to make the relationship work. The goal is to remove every obstacle that we can, which paves the way towards reconciliation to pave the way towards reconciliation. I've had experiences with broken relationships. I've messed up trying to fix broken relationships. And I know the hurt and the pain that can come with that. And it's my desire and it's my prayer for us church that we would get the right tools in order to fix our relationships that there wouldn't be an elephant in the room, that there wouldn't be awkwardness between you and the other person, but you would have the, the appropriate tools in your toolbox and you'd know which tools to take out to mend those relationships. Why? We were created for relationship. We are created for relationship with God and one another. And when you answer the question that we like to ask at the Rock Christian family, what does love require of me? Often, Love requires of you taking the first step towards reconciliation. Next time, I'm going to give you the first decision that paves the way towards reconciliation. Between now and next time, I want you to wrestle with this question. What's stopping me from trying? That broken relationship that you have right now, maybe it's recent or it's been going on for a long time. Maybe it's been so long you forgot that the broken relationship ever happened. What's stopping you from trying to reconcile the relationship? Or what's stopping you from trying to do everything you can to remove every obstacle to move towards reconciliation? And then whatever comes to mind immediately, which will probably be an excuse, set aside all of that temporarily and re-ask it this way, what's stopping me from trying really?
Get rid of the excuses. Get rid of the blame game. It doesn't matter whose fault it is. What's stopping me from trying, really? In our relationships, if we're going to have the same mindset as Jesus, our Lord, it's required. Reconciling relationships is required. It's not optional. It's required. This is how we follow Jesus. This is how we follow Jesus. And we'll pick it up right there next time in part two of how we get people to see things. No, not that one. Reassembly required. A beginner's guide to repairing broken relationships.